if f of x is continuous over the closed interval AB and differentiable over the open interval, then the mean value theorem states that there's at least one point in the open interval where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. So that will be the slope of the secant line, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And this can be observed here where the slope of the tangent of the curve is equal to the slope of this secant line. And note that this can be true at more than one point. So for example, if the function looks something like this, then you can find more than one point where the slope of the tangent line is equal to the slope of the secant line. Find a value c such that the derivative of this function evaluated at c is equal to the slope of the secant in this interval. So the derivative of the function at c in this case is equal to 2c plus 1. And that's equal to the slope of the secant, so that will be f of 1 minus f of minus 2 over 1 minus negative 2 by the mean value theorem. And therefore we get 2c plus 1 is equal to f of 1 which is 0 minus f of minus 2 which is also 0 over 1 minus negative 2. And therefore c is equal to minus a half. And I encourage you to actually plot this function and you'll see that the derivative at c is equal to the slope of the secant, which we can see on the right hand side is equal to zero. Let's find the value c such that the derivative of the function here, evaluated at c, is equal to the slope of the secant in this interval. Well, evaluating the derivative of this function at c gives minus one on c squared. And we equate that with the slope of the secant, which is f of two, minus f of minus 1 over 2 minus negative 1 by the mean value theorem. So what this gives is minus 1 on c squared is equal to 1 half minus negative 1 which is plus 1 over 3 so that would be minus 1 on c squared is equal to 3 on 2 on 3 which is 1 half. So therefore c squared is equal to minus 2 and there's no solution to this equation so there's no such value c in this interval where the slope of this curve is equal to the slope of the secant here on the right hand side. Given the following position time curve, we're asked to find the time at which the instantaneous velocity is equal to the average velocity in the closed interval from 1 to 2. Well the slope of the secant of the position time curve is the average velocity, so that's dx dt, which is 5 minus 2 on 2 minus 1 or 3 meters per second. And now using the mean value theorem, we can find x dash of c. So the derivative of this function is 2t, and from this derivative we get 2c. And now by the mean value theorem, if we equate these two together, we get 2c is equal to 3, or c is equal to 1.5 seconds. So therefore at 1.5 seconds, the instantaneous velocity, which is the slope of the tangent to this curve, is equal to the average velocity, which is the slope of the secant. If a function is continuous over the closed interval from a to b, then the extreme value theorem states that the function has at least one minimum and one maximum. So in other words, the value of the function at d is less than f of x, which is less than f of c, for all x in that interval. Now if we look at this second example, the interval's open at c, so we can observe that the function has a maximum at d, but because f of c does not exist, and if we observe the limit of the function as x approaches c from the right, which evaluates the f of c, so in this case as x approaches c, the function approaches f of c, but never quite gets there, so there's no minimum. For a continuous function f of x, there's a critical point at x equals c if the derivative at c is equal to zero, so we have a horizontal tangent, or the derivative is not defined, or does not exist. So in this case we'd have a vertical tangent. So here are examples of critical points where we have horizontal tangents, and here is an example of a critical point where there's a vertical tangent. So if we draw tangents towards that point, 
you can see that they're getting more steep. So effectively the derivative or the slope of the tangent to the curve is approaching minus infinity from the left and plus infinity from the right. Let's visualize global and local extrema. So if we're looking at the function in a closed interval from a to b, we can observe that there's a global maximum. So all the function values are less than this value. And we also have a global minimum at a because all the values of the function are greater than this value in that interval. So that means we have a local minimum here. And because we have a critical point where there's a horizontal tangent at C, then this global maximum is also a local maximum. So in other words, all local extrema, which are also referred to as relative extrema, occur at critical points. And as we can see, not all critical points are global extrema. So in other words, this critical point is a local minimum, and this is the global minimum. Let's identify all the local and global extrema in the closed interval 0 to 5 for each curve below. So if we start with this blue curve, from 0 to 5, this point here is the absolute or global maximum, because there's no other y value on this curve that's larger than this one. And we call this point here a global minimum, because that has the lowest possible value in that interval. So therefore this here is a local minimum. And at x equals 5, this value is not defined. So try to determine the extrema for the other curves and post your answer in the comments. Let's identify the critical points for all the curves below. So recall that a critical point is where the curve changes direction. So the derivative is equal to 0 or the derivative is undefined or does not exist. So for this red curve, we can see that this point here has a zero slope or a horizontal tangent to the curve and so does this point. So these are critical points. And for the parabola, this here is a critical point for the same reason where the derivative is equal to zero. And for this curve over here, we have a cusp. So in this case, the derivative is undefined but we can see there's a change of direction. So therefore, this is also a critical point. The derivative can provide information on a function, including the intervals on which it's increasing or decreasing. So if we look at the interval from a to b, the derivative is less than zero, so the slope of the tangent to the curve of the function is negative, and therefore the function is decreasing over this interval. And from b to c, the derivative is positive, so the function is increasing. And from c to d, the derivative is negative, so the function is decreasing, and so on, so the function increases after d. Now where the derivative is zero, the function has critical points, where it changes direction. And where the slope of the tangent to the curve of the derivative is zero, that means the second derivative is zero. And that's where the function has inflection points, where it changes curvature, from concave up to concave down and vice versa. The first derivative test can be used to find local or relative extrema. So if y is a function of x, then what we do is differentiate it, assuming it's differentiable, and then set the derivative to zero. And that will give us the x value with the local extreme or critical points are. Because we're just basically testing the points where the slope of the tangent to the curve is zero. Also, if we test the derivative in the vicinity of these points, so to the left and to the right, then without using the second derivative, we can identify whether the critical point is a minimum or a maximum. So on the left, the derivative is greater than zero, and on the right, it's less than zero. So this is a local maximum, and here we have the derivative being less than zero, and to the right it's greater than zero, so this is a local minimum. Let's use the first derivative test to find the critical point, and also use the derivative to justify why the function is increasing or decreasing along different intervals. Well, the derivative of this function is equal to two by x minus one, and if you set that equal to zero, the x value with the slope of the tangent to the curve is 0, is equal to 1. And then substituting x equals 1 into our original function, then y of 1 is equal to 3. So that's our critical point. And we can also observe from the derivative that for x is less than 1, then the slope of the tangent to the curve is negative, and therefore the function is decreasing. And for x greater than 1, we can see that the slope of the tangent to the curve is positive, and therefore the function is increasing. 
The candidates test can be used to find global or absolute extrema. And this applies to some closed interval of a function. So given y is a function of x, we first test for local or relative extrema by setting the first derivative to zero. And that gives us a critical point where the slope of the tangent to the curve is zero. And at this point we've established that the critical points are local or relative extrema. So we have a local maximum and a local minimum. And now to determine if these are global extrema, we test them against the endpoints. So as we can see, this critical point is also a global maximum because it's the highest value of the function in this interval. So even higher than the value of the function at a and b. And this critical point is also a global minimum because it's also lower than the value of the function at a and b, being the endpoints. Use the candidates test to determine which critical points are global extrema in the closed interval a, b. Well, if we look at the critical points, that's these two. So let's just take this one at x equals c and this one at x equals d. So if we want to determine if this is a global maximum, well, what we do is check if f of c is greater than the values at the ends of the interval. So this value is clearly larger than f of a and f of b. So this is a global maximum. And if we check f of d against the ends of the interval, well, we can see that f of d is greater than f of a. So therefore, it's not a global minimum. It's a local minimum. We can use a second derivative to determine the concavity of a function over its domain. So if we look at the open interval from minus infinity to 0 0.7, the second derivative is positive. So therefore, the graph is concave up. And over the open interval from 0 0.7 to infinity, the second derivative is negative. So therefore, the graph is concave down. And we can observe that when the second derivative is zero, that's an inflection point where there's a transition in curvature of the function's graph. And if we look at a critical point and take the slope of the tangent to the curve slightly after, well, we can see that the finite change in the slope of the tangent to the curve with respect to x is less than zero here. So a negative slope minus a zero slope. And that's consistent with our second derivative. The second derivative can tell us if a critical point is a local minimum or a local maximum. So recall that at a critical point, the slope of the tangent to the curve is zero. And to determine whether it's a minimum or a maximum, we take the second derivative. So if the second derivative is greater than zero, then a graph is concave up in the vicinity of that critical point. And therefore, the critical point is a local minimum. Now for this critical point, the slope of the tangent to the curve is also zero but the second derivative is less than zero. So therefore the graph is concave down in the vicinity of that critical point and it's a local maximum. And that's consistent with the graph of the second derivative over here. Let's use a second derivative test to determine if the critical points are maxima or minima. So we can see that the critical points where the curve changes direction is at x equals zero, two, and four. So if you took the derivative of this function, you're gonna get x cubed minus 6x squared plus 8x. And then if you take the second derivative, you're going to get 3x squared minus 12x plus 8. And if you substitute for x equals 0, well, what we get is y dash dash of 0 is equal to 8. And given that's a positive value, our critical point at x equals 0 is a minimum. And if you substitute x equals 2, you're going to get a negative value for a maximum. And for x equals 4, you're going to get a positive value for a minimum. So really have a think about why a positive value gives us a minimum. Now to find the inflection points, what you do is set y dash dash of x to zero, and then you get two solutions. So your inflection points are gonna occur somewhere near x equals one and near x equals three. We can identify the key features of a function and its derivatives using all three representations. And you may be given either graph or either representation to predict and explain a behavior of the function. So we can observe the behavior of the derivative over the open interval from minus infinity to zero. So it's positive and therefore the function's increasing. And the same from zero to infinity. So the slope of the tangent to the curve is always positive. But at zero, the slope of the tangent to the curve is zero. So therefore this is indicative of a critical point. And you can see that from the analytical representation. But at this critical point, the graph is neither concave up or concave down. So at x equals zero, it's really an inflection point. And from minus infinity to zero, you can see the second derivative is negative. So therefore the graph is concave down. And from zero to infinity, 
the second derivative is positive, so the graph is concave up. And we'll get some practice on sketching the curves of functions and its derivatives using several examples. Let's sketch the following polynomial curve. Well, we can find the y-intercept by setting x equals 0, and then differentiating the function with respect to x. Well, what we get is x cubed minus 6x squared plus 8x, and then setting the derivative to 0, and factorizing this expression, we get x by x minus 2 by x minus 4. So therefore, we're going to have critical points at x equals 0, x equals 2, and x equals 4. And if you sub these x values in this equation, well, what you're going to get is y of 0 is equal to 3, y of 2 is equal to 7, and y of 4 is equal to 3. So that's our critical points. And you can go further by taking the second derivative to determine if each of these critical points are concave up or concave down. But we're going to take a guess that that looks something like this. Let's sketch the following curve. So if we set x equals to 0, we get y is equal to negative 2. And if we set y is equal to 0, then we get the following equation. And therefore solving for x, we get x is equal to 1 plus or minus 3 root 3. So x is going to be around 6 and minus 4. And if we take the derivative, well, what we get is 2 thirds by x minus 1 to the negative a third. And therefore we can see that there's going to be a critical point at x equals 1 because the derivative is not defined. And if you substitute x equals 1 into this equation, you're going to get y is negative 3. So that's our critical point. So our curve is going to look something like this with a cusp at this point. And you can take the second derivative to verify that the curve is concave down on both sides. Let's sketch the following curve. So if we take x equals 0, we're going to get y is equal to negative 3. And if we take the limit as x approaches 2 from the left hand side, so that's going to evaluate to minus infinity. And as x approaches 2 from the right hand side, this evaluates to positive infinity. So we have an asymptote at x equals 2. And if we also take the limit as x goes to infinity, then y is going to go to 0. So we have an asymptote at y equals 0 also. So the curve is going to look something like this. Let's sketch the following curve. So setting x equals 0, we're going to get 6 on 4, or 3 on 2. And if we take the limit as x goes to 2 from the left hand side, well y is going to approach infinity. And as x approaches 2 from the right hand side, y is also going to go to infinity. So therefore, we have an asymptote at 2. And if we also take the limit as x goes to infinity, and also as x goes to minus infinity, then y is going to go to 0. So our curve looks something like this. Let's sketch the following curve. So y of 0 is equal to 0. So that's our first point on the curve. And if we take the limit as x approaches 2 from the right hand side, well what we'd get is plus infinity. And as x approaches 2 from the left hand side, we get minus infinity. So we can draw in our asymptote at x equals 2. And now if we take the limit as x goes to infinity, and also as x goes to minus infinity, well what we'd get is 6. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 6. And now we can plot our curve. Let's sketch the following curve. So y of 0 is 1 quarter, so that's the y-intercept. And if we set y equals 0, then x equals 1. So we have the x-intercept at 1. And now if we take the limit as x goes to minus 2 from the left and right, then y approaches infinity. So we have an asymptote at minus 2. And if we take the limit as x approaches infinity, then y approaches 1. 
So we have an asymptote at y equals 1. And now taking the derivative using the quotient rule, you're going to get 6 by x minus 1 on x plus 2 cubed. And setting this to 0, we get a critical point at x equals 1. And y of 1, as we saw, is 0. So this here is our critical point. So therefore the curve must pass through the y-axis, turn around at 1, and asymptote to y equals 1. And on this side, the curve approaches both asymptotes. Let's sketch the following curve. So because the degree of the polynomial in the numerator is larger than that in the denominator, we use long division to put the equation in this form. And the y-intercept is at minus 5 on 2, so that's our first point on the curve. And as x approaches infinity, the curve's going to approach this straight line, because this term becomes dominant. And that's our oblique asymptote, which is a straight line through y equals 2. And now as x approaches 2, then we get an asymptote at 2. And now if we take the derivative, that gives 1 minus 9 on x minus 2 squared. And if we set the derivative to 0, our critical points are at x equals minus 1 and x equals 5. And then substituting back into our original equation, we get the following y values. So our critical points are somewhere around here, and our curve looks something like this. Let's sketch the following curve. So because the degree of the polynomial in the numerator is greater than that in the denominator, we're going to get an oblique asymptote. And we can use polynomial long division to write the equation in this form. So when x equals 0, y is equal to 0, so that's our first point. And when x equals 1, y is also equal to 0. So that's another point on the curve here. Now we can see that we have a removable discontinuity at x equals 1. So we can draw in our circle here. And when x goes to infinity, the curve approaches this straight line which passes through y equals minus 2. So that's our oblique asymptote. And when x approaches minus 1, we have a vertical asymptote at x equals minus 1. And then differentiating this function, what we get is 1 minus 2 on x plus 1 squared. And then setting the derivative to 0, you get the critical points, which are somewhere here. So the curve looks something like this. Let's sketch the following absolute value curve. So the speed is the magnitude of the velocity. And v of 0 is equal to 2. And when v equals 0, we can factorize the equation. So we get t minus 2, t minus 1. So these are our x-intercepts at 1 and 2. And then differentiating the velocity, that gives us 2t minus 3. And setting this to 0, we have a critical point at 1.5. So our critical point is around minus 0 0.3. And then taking the second derivative, you're going to get a positive value. So our critical point is a minimum. So our curve looks something like this. And because we're taking the absolute value, then this is our actual curve here for the speed which is the magnitude of the velocity. Let's sketch the graph for the function f of x from x equals 0 to 4. And we're given a few values of f of x. So initially the derivative is positive and decreasing. So the slope of the tangent to the curve for the function is positive and decreasing. And then at x equals 1 we have a critical point, so a change in direction. And somewhere here, the slope of the tangent to the derivative is 0 or well, the second derivative is 0, so we have an inflection point or a change in curvature. And the derivative is 0 at x equals 2, so we have a critical point, so a change in direction. And then somewhere here we have an inflection point, because the second derivative is 0, so we have a change in curvature. And at x equals 3 we have a critical point, so we have a change in direction. And at this value of x, which is around 3.5, we have an inflection point, so a change in curvature. And this is our rough sketch of the graph of f of x. Given the first derivative of a twice differentiable function, we're asked to determine if the function is increasing or decreasing over the interval from 1 to 5. And I've plotted the points here for visualization. So because the function is twice differentiable, so the first derivative must be continuous, and you can get infinitely many curves like this. So therefore, given the derivative can be positive or negative, then we don't know if it's increasing or decreasing over the interval. I'll just write don't know. And is the function concave up or concave down? So to obtain a second derivative, we have the slope of the tangent to the first derivative, 
which is different at different points, so we can't conclude that the function is either concave up or concave down. Now part C asks us, what is the second derivative evaluated at a value C? Given the average rate of change of the derivative in the interval, is equal to its instantaneous rate of change. Well here we can use the mean value theorem, so that gives us a slope of the secant of the derivative, and that gives minus 7 on 4. We can relate the key features of a function to its derivatives. So what we have here is the position of a particle, for example, as a function of time, and the velocity is the rate of change of the position with respect to time. And the acceleration is the first derivative of the velocity, or the second derivative of the position. Now we can observe that the position is increasing, but the slope of the tangent to the curve is decreasing. So therefore the velocity, or the first derivative, is positive and decreasing. And when it gets to zero, the particle changes direction, and then you have tangents that are negative thereafter. So in other words, the velocity is increasing in a negative direction, as we can see. And the acceleration being the second derivative of the position, well that's always negative and constant, because the velocity is linear, and the slope of the tangent to the curve is constant and negative. And because the second derivative is negative, well as we can see the graph of the function, or the position versus time, is concave down. So therefore the critical point is a local maximum. Optimization problems involve finding a minimum or maximum value of a function on a given interval. So these will typically be presented as worded problems, and you'll interpret those worded problems into functions, and in general, the function you'll be dealing with is a function of an independent variable, and it can also be a composite function. And to find the minimum or maximum value of the function we're looking for, we differentiate it and set the derivative to zero. So that gives you your critical point, and then you can differentiate again, assuming that the function is twice differentiable, and check if the second derivative is less than or greater than zero, to determine whether the critical point is a local minimum or maximum. So the optimization problem may also be subjected to a constraint. So for example, you may be restricted to some interval over a function's domain. And we'll look at how to solve these types of worded problems in the following video. Let's look at how to solve optimization problems, which are presented as worded problems. So a rectangular pool is fenced off on all four sides, using 100 meters of fencing. Then the perimeter of fencing is written as follows. And we've simplified this problem, so we're not considering the offset of the fencing from the pool. Now what we're looking for is the maximum area of the pool that can be fenced off. So the maximum and minimum of a function can have different meanings in different contexts. So the area is equal to x by y. So what we'll do is solve for y, and then substitute that into the area. To get the area as a function of one variable, because we need to differentiate it and set it to zero to obtain a maximum area. So that gives x is equal to 25 meters. And if you substitute for y, so the maximum area is basically that of a square. Now to verify that this is a maximum, we take the second derivative. So because the second derivative is negative, then our result is indeed a maximum, which you can observe from this inverted parabola. A builder has 40 meters of fencing to fence off three sides of a house. And what is the maximum area of the land that can be fenced off? So if we denote the horizontal dimension as x, and the two vertical dimensions as y, then the perimeter is x plus 2y, and that's equal to the amount of fencing we have, so 40 meters. And because we're asked for the maximum area, well the area is x by y, and we can substitute for x, so we can write this as 40 minus 2y by y, so we can have the area as a function of one variable, and then we can differentiate the area with respect to y. So that's equal to 40 minus 4y. And then setting this derivative to zero, we get y is equal to 10 meters. And substituting for y, we can get x is equal to 20 meters. So therefore the maximum area of the land is 20 by 10, or 200 meters squared. Let's find the closest point on this line to a point 0, 1. Well if we choose an arbitrary point on the line, x, y, well the squared distance from this point to this point over here, we can obtain using Pythagoras. So that would be d squared is equal to x squared plus y minus 1 squared. And now we can substitute for y, so we can write this as x squared plus 3x plus 5 minus 1, so that would be 3x plus 4 squared, and then we differentiate with respect to x, Okay, so we differentiate the squared distance, and what we get is 2x plus 6 by 3x plus 4. 
which is equal to 20x plus 24. And now we can set this derivative to 0. And therefore x is equal to minus 24 on 20 or minus 6 on 5. And then if you substitute for x into this equation, well you're going to get your y value, which is 7 on 5. Let's find the closest point on this curve to the point 4, 0. Well the squared distance between some point on this line to this point over here, we can obtain by Pythagoras. So that will be x minus 4 squared plus y squared. And we can substitute for y to get this as a function of one variable. So we get x minus 4 squared plus 2 root x squared, which is plus 4x. And now we can differentiate this with respect to x. So that would be 2 by x minus 4 plus 4, or 2x minus 8 plus 4, which is minus 4. And therefore setting this derivative to 0, we get x is equal to 2. And then substituting for x equals 2, we get y is 2 root 2. So the closest point is somewhere here on that curve. A projectile is launched to a horizontal distance r. And we're asked to find the angle theta that maximizes the range r. So we have the initial speed. We have the launch angle from the horizontal. So if we differentiate the range with respect to theta, we get 2 v naught x squared, which is a horizontal component of the velocity, on g by cosine 2 theta. And if we set this derivative to 0, so with this expression to be 0, 0 is equal to cosine 2 theta, and 2 theta must therefore be a multiple of pi on 2. So because the launch angle must be less than 90 degrees, so then 2 theta must be equal to pi on 2, and therefore theta is equal to pi on 4. So the angle that's going to maximize the range is 45 degrees. A rectangular prism has a volume of 24 meters cubed, and we're asked to find the dimensions of the prism that will minimize its surface area, assuming it has a square base. So therefore the dimensions of the base are the same, and it has some height y. So the volume is therefore x squared y. And the surface area is 2 times the area of one base plus 4 times the area of one side. And now we can substitute for y to make the area a function of one variable. So we have 4x multiplied by 24 on x squared. And that gives 2x squared plus 96 on x. And then differentiating the area with respect to x, we get 4x minus 96 on x squared. And now you can set the derivative to 0. And that's going to give you x is equal to 2.9 meters. And if you substitute for x in this equation, that's also going to give you y is equal to x. A rectangular football field is to fit into an ellipse with radii 50 and 30 meters. And we're asked to find the maximum possible area of the football field. So if we take x and y on the ellipse, then the area of this rectangle is equal to 2x multiplied by 2y. And from the equation of an ellipse, so that's x squared on 50 squared plus y squared on 30 squared equals 1. Well, you can substitute for y to get the area in terms of x and take the derivative of a with respect to x and set it to 0. And then that's going to give you your x value, which you can substitute into this equation to get the y value. And finally, substitute in this equation to get the area. So leave your answer in the comments. We can extend the applications of derivatives to implicitly define functions. So remember where we had an implicit function and differentiated it. So where we had x terms, we can differentiate it directly with respect to x. And for the y terms, we differentiate using the chain rule. And then solve the resulting equation for the y dx. So if you're given some point x, y, then you can basically substitute these into the derivative. And if the derivative is 0 or does not exist, then you have a critical point. And similarly, if it's greater than 0, the function's increasing. And less than 0, the function is decreasing. And if you differentiate this to obtain a second derivative, and as we've seen, this second derivative may depend on x, y, and the first derivative. And similar to the explicit functions that we've been dealing with, this derivative gives us information on concavity. And if the second derivative is 0, we have an inflection point. And we'll get some practice in applying the derivatives to implicit functions. 
determine if the implicit relation is increasing or decreasing at this point. Well, if we differentiate this implicitly, we have 3y squared by dy dx minus 2x is equal to 0, and therefore dy dx is equal to 2x on 3y squared. And if you substitute for x equals 1 and y equals cube root 2, then you're going to get a positive derivative. And because the derivative is greater than 0, then the function is increasing. Let's determine if the curve given by this implicit relation is concave up or concave down at this point. So if we differentiate implicitly, we get 3y squared dy dx is equal to 2x, and therefore the derivative is 2x on 3y squared. And then differentiating again, we can use the quotient rule. So we have 3y squared by 2 minus 2x by 6y dy dx. And that's divided by 3y squared, all squared, which is 9y to the 4. And now you can substitute for x and y to get the derivative. And then substitute for x, y, and dy dx to get the second derivative. And from that you can determine if the curve is concave up or down and post your answer in the comments. Let's find the equation of the tangent and normal lines to the curve at x equals 2 and y equals 5 to the third. Well, the general equation of a line is y minus y naught is equal to the slope by x minus x naught, where x naught y naught is a point on the line. So therefore, if you differentiate this expression implicitly and substitute for x and y, you're going to get the slope of the tangent line. And if you take a point on the line, so that would be this point, which is at x equals 2, and y equals 5 to the third, then you can write the equation of the tangent line in the form of y equals mx plus c. And for the normal line, which is perpendicular to the tangent line, so the slope would be the reciprocal of the negative of the slope of the tangent line. And think about why that is, and post your answer in the comments. Does y of x have a minimum or a maximum if the derivative is equal to y cosine x, and y at x equals pi on 2 is equal to 2. Well, if we substitute for pi on 2, what we get is y of pi on 2 is equal to 2, and that's multiplied by cosine pi on 2. So this is equal to 0, and therefore it's a critical point. Now if we take the second derivative, so that's equal to y by minus sine x plus dy dx, by cosine x, by the product rule. And at pi on 2, dy dx, as we've seen, is 0, so this term is 0. And the first term is y of pi on 2, which is 2, multiplied by minus sine pi on 2, which is minus 1, so that gives minus 2. And because the second derivative is negative, so the critical point is a maximum. 